All right. We're ready then. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the inaugural uh, uh, energy storage at PNNL event series. So during this webinar series uh, that we, we have scheduled for the next several months, uh, we hope to really reach out and start exploring some of the hot research topics in energy storage and start looking at those and how they tie to the new grid storage launch pad uh, that's being constructed at PNNL. There we go. We see it on the screen now. So this new $75 million facility is really aimed at um, accelerating the development of next generation technologies. So GSL, as we, we call it, will do that through three focused uh, mission areas. One, how do we accelerate that development and deployment? How can we propagate rigorous grid duty cycles throughout every stage of the development process from basic science and materials all the way up through systems so we have a higher level of confidence of those technologies coming out? Secondly, how do we validate that these systems work at scale? And we're looking at systems as a complete system, validating those up to about 100 kilowatt hours uh, in duration. And the goal there is to get it to a stage where we can sufficiently de-risk it for industry to, to take on. And our final mission in GSL is really to collaborate. How do we link these capabilities that we have at GSL with others across the DOE complex to provide a holistic suite of solutions to industry to tackle those energy storage barriers that we are going to discuss. And so within the uh, GSL, those capabilities are gonna run from fundamental science that's aimed at uh, understanding materials behavior while they're in operation of uh, charging and discharging in a new in-operando center. How can we scale those discoveries up through uh, various prototyping lines uh, and scaling up of materials and finally, the testing and validation of 100 kilowatt scale systems. So in today's presentation, uh, Matt Pace is going to start us off with energy storage safety, which is a uh, obviously a hot topic in, uh, uh, for energy storage. And so, as I said, this will be one of several that will run out throughout the year. And we're hoping that, you know, through these presentations, we can start that dialogue on with you, our stakeholders, on terms of you know, what are the critical aspects that as GSL is put into operation, we can tackle uh, within the grid or energy storage launch pad uh, the, to drive uh, the cost of these systems down, improve the lifetimes, and ensure that they are going to work as deployed. So everything you're going to see probably in the, over the next uh, uh, few weeks of this and the grid storage uh, launch pad is part of uh, the portfolio of Dr. Imre Zhu. And we are honored to have Imra today to help us kick off uh, this new series. So with that, Imra, I'll turn it over to you and thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Imra Duke. And as it says, I run the Office of Electricity Energy Storage Program. Now, we started this about 20 years ago. And we started very small. And it's been rather a hard road towards acceptance of energy storage as, sta as a standard part of the portfolio of utilities. At the beginning, uh, it was a very small program. And basically, the applications were niche applications. We wanted to find uh, an application that uh, is commercially viable. And that happened with frequency regulation. And then over the years, we identified more applications that were commercially viable, at least in certain regulatory frameworks. And it moved from being a niche application to being a uh, a standard tool, at least with many utilities. But now we are in a new phase. We are now moving into an era where energy storage will be an essential part of decarbonization. 
uh, it's going to be part of our, our lifeline because we must decarbonize in future and we must bring on renewable energy. So the energy storage program, because it started at the very beginning, encompasses uh, a wide uh, portfolio of uh, activities. Uh, as Vince mentioned, it started with uh, exploring materials for energy storage, uh, batteries basically. And from there, it moved on to devices. And uh, then we developed the analytics, the models to analyze those devices and to identify uh, successful business cases. And having a number of business cases, of course, led to the fact that there were sometimes glitches, uh, particularly with certain technologies, and we had to go into safety. Uh, today, you will hear a lot about safety from Matt Pace. Uh, but it didn't stop there because it went on to developing codes and standards and policy and even uh, getting into finance and uh, international relations. So a very wide portfolio. And in this, of course, the Office of Electricity has relied on its uh, core laboratories. And chief among those are Sandia National Laboratory and Pacific Northwest Laboratory. And uh, there are other laboratories like Argonne and Oak Ridge that are also involved. But uh, in this series now, our focus will be on Pacific Northwest Laboratories and the many contrib contributions which they have made to the uh, energy storage uh, program uh, over the years and even more so uh, currently. Uh, and of course, they're also bringing you the uh, new launch pad, which will become a center of testing and exploring new technologies and uh, it will be a great service to uh, industry, to utilities, and to the country. And now with further ado, without further ado, we will go to the uh, presentations, uh, which uh, Vince will introduce. Thank you. Thank you, Amra. And thank you for your support over the years and kind of being that consistent voice advocating for energy storage. It's much appreciated. So with that, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Matt Pace, uh, who will be our speaker today. Matt serves as a technical advisor in the Battery uh, Materials and Systems Group. Prior to joining PNNL, he spent 28 years with the San Jose Fire Department, retiring as a uh, fire captain. Matt has 10 years experience on Renewable Energy Codes and Standards Committee and currently serves on NFPA 855, UL Technical Standard Panels 9540, 1947, and IEC TC uh, 120 Working Group 5. He served as a subject matter expert for the National Fire Protection Association on energy storage and has contributed to model fire code selections on PV and, and uh, energy storage systems. So with that, Matt, we'll turn it over to you and take it away. Thank you. Great, thank you, Vince. Dr. Zhuk, thank you very much. Uh, let me go ahead and bring up my slide deck here to share. Okay, great. So um, thank you everybody for joining um, and looking at the attendees, uh, many respected uh, industry leaders on there that I know from around the world. So thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, to join this uh, first webinar session. Uh, this first slide uh, just gives us a, a quick overview of the structure of our validated safety and reliability program uh, led by Dr. Jacques. David Reed is a program manager, a, a scientist at PNNL and manages a, a wide variety of programs. Um, the ones on safety is just one of them. And uh, <clears throat> within that group, you know, I, I really focus on the system safety 
codes and standards and education and outreach. Uh, we have Ryan Franks, who's a recent add to the lab, uh, focusing on reliability, and uh, uh, Vish Viswanathan, who focuses on performance and some of the battery testing at the lab. So these areas broken down um, really focuses a lot on um, creating the codes and standards uh, with the, the it, it's a consensual or a, a consensus process to develop a lot of these codes and standards. Um, we work with Sandia on the Energy Storage Safety Collaborative and produce a quarterly report. I'll provide you a link to that a little bit later on another slide. And uh, these are the number of the committees that I work on. Vincent mentioned them, but here's just a graphic of the, the actual standards and technical committees. Um, another activity that we're involved in is, uh, and this is being led by Ryan, is an update to the Department of Energy's Energy Storage Safety Strategy. Uh, that's a document that was created um, about six years ago, and we're uh, working with Sandia to try and develop an update for that that reflects the current uh, kind of landscape of energy storage. Uh, and the last line there is just our reliability form that's occurring on May 4th and 5th. It's a virtual event, and we hope that you can join us at that event there. So what is safety? Um, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's referred to a lot in energy storage, um, but I think it's really important to have some perspective on it. You know, from the very basic Webster uh, definition, the condition of being safe uh, from undergoing or causing hurt, injury, or loss, and to protect against failure, breakage, or accident. And it's not consistent across industries or technologies. Uh, very often, new technologies are under the limelight when it comes to safety. So I think it's an important question for us to ask ourselves is, with regards to energy storage, does it mean zero fires? Or is there an acceptable level of, of failure? we talk about the, this example, I think it's good to look at uh, car fires, for example. Um, anytime an electric vehicle is displayed in the media, having experienced a, a failure in a fire, it gets a lot of uh, sensationalism applied to it. But when you look at this little graphic created by an auto insurance company that was utilized in some um, writings recently, uh, they found that the, of the car fires, the number one was actually hybrid, then purely internal combustion was behind that and electric vehicles per 100,000 vehicle sales was a very, very small number of fires. Um, so it, that's a very interesting statistic, um, but I think the result demonstrated by the data there is that EVs are very safe. Now it's not to say that the, the fire itself, it does represent some challenges in extinguishing it. And uh, that is not to be um, underplayed. It is an important tactic that the fire department really needs to understand. Now, when we talk about battery safety, it's really important to understand that this is a systems level responsibility. Um, you know, often I'll see on social media, certain chemistry manufacturers touting their chemistry as being fire safe or not able to go into thermal runaway. And uh, you know that, that is not true. Um, the safety of a system is more than just chemistry. Um, it can involve the chemistry or the, the quality control of that particular cell, how it's integrated in the energy storage system, how it's managed by the battery management system to stop charging at, the, um, at its full SOC. Um, how problems are communicated and handled, those communications. Um, is it in a conditioned space held at the right temperature range and uh, humidity? Um, is the fire protection system uh, properly designed and installed for, for the risk? Um, is there an explosion control system incorporated into it? And overall, really probably the most critical is the workmanship. So all of these really lead to um, you know, a high quality energy storage system. Now this slide here, I think is a very important slide. Um, EPRI has developed a forward facing database of publicly announced fires that have occurred in the CNI space. 
And these incidents um, are ones that have been um, you know, made public through, through some kind of media announcement. So it does not represent all fires or all failures. It also doesn't provide any fire cause analysis. So it's really just a very narrow slice of the industry, but I think it, it provides some data. Um, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll draw some attention to this top one here in Moss Landing, um, which is a, this particular site has experienced two failures that as a result has taken 400 megawatts off the grid in California. That's really a significant uh, issue here in California. I live in California. As a matter of fact, Moss Landing is about 30 miles uh, from where I live. And I live up on top of a mountaintop and I can, can see its beautiful towers. Um, that site is one that I'm personally very interested in and it was very unfortunate to hear about the failures, but it's a good example of how the overall system design and the safety systems uh, led to some of the loss and the prolonged uh, outage that they're experiencing. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that perhaps Ryan might have dropped in the, there you go, thank you, Ryan. I just noticed that, appreciate that. It's got my back. Uh, great database to keep track of there. All right. So on the residential side, um, this space is one that I have some real interest in. Um, because really to decarbonize our grid, it is gonna require a distributed uh, array of storage. So even starting at the residential site, um, but there have been a couple of failures um, in the space, not a lot, but it's important to understand that these are occupancies where we sleep. So the risk profile is much higher in terms of potential loss of, of life. And, <clears throat> The other uh, item is that the residential space is one that's typically um, somewhat void of an operations and maintenance program. Uh, you may or may not even have communications to the asset if the homeowner's network drops out. And so it's in a sense, it's the most orphaned set of, of energy storage as opposed to the uh, commercial and industrial settings. Uh, but there is a significant amount of growth and interest in storage at the residential level. And I think that it's a very important space to understand how to um, address safety. So let's spend a few slides just to talk about what occurs in a failure. I know for many of you that are on this call, you're experts in this field. So I apologize for taking a step back in the basicness of this, uh, but I think it's important. These are the modes that lithium ion uh, chemistries can fail with the primary ones being either electrical abuse or internal faults. Um, thermal abuse, you know, be either being near too much heat or exposed to um, lack of uh, HVAC. Mechanical abuse is more uh, for the manufacturing space or the assembly of large energy storage and environmental impacts could re reflect increasing floods, uh, weather events and seismic events that all of these could be supposed to, but we really have not seen a lot of failures specifically due to environmental impacts yet. Now, when we talk about what the fire service learns, how they understand firefighting, they're taught about the fire triangle and that stopping a fire is simply just removing one leg of that triangle, removing the fuel or the oxygen or the heat. But when you inject a chemical chain reaction, such as one that occurs in an exothermic reaction from a, a thermal runaway event, um, that can be a self-sustaining process whereby removing oxygen may or may not stop that process. And removing the fuel is difficult because it's embedded into the system. And so really all we're left with is trying to remove the heat. And that's very, very challenging in a deep seated um, highly dense energy storage system. Um, and so what we've seen is that some chemistries can continue combustion process in low oxygen atmospheres. And the most important point is that last bullet, which is that flammable gases will continue to be produced even if there's no visible flame. So if cells are going to thermal runaway, even without ignition, there's flammable gases that represent um, a risk. So thermal runaway, again, it's the process where self-heating of the cell occurs faster that can be dissipated. 
and it results in vaporizing the electrolyte and potentially fire and or explosions. And they can begin between 80 and 120 degrees Celsius. Uh, once the liquid electrolyte enters a vapor stage, the pressure increases and it's vented out of the cell. Um, you can have ignition of those gases, or if not ignition, you can definitely have an explosive environment. If there is flaming, then that radiative energy can speed along propagation to other cells. So it's a, a catch-22. Fire is good for consuming flammable gases, but it speeds the, the conductive process through the rest of the, of the module. I've got two videos. Many of you have seen these, but I just wanna play them real quick because they do show a very effective um, experience of rapid venting of cells. And this is a residential product. This is a personal mobility device. So the scooter is being charged and is undergoing thermal runaway. Now, for those of you who have not seen that video, it's a terrifying video. And what's important to state is one, there is now a new UL standard for personal mobility devices that was developed after some of these hoverboard fires started happening a few years ago. Um, I can't speak to whether or not that device was UL listed, um, but what's important just to understand is that that's a fairly small amount of storage. Um, I don't know how many cells vented uh, at that time, but the process of venting produces a very large amount of uh, flammable gases and there was an ignition source. And so that result there is really what we're trying to address. This next one here, um, you'll, you'll note next to the TV down at the bottom there, um, hopefully you can see my, my mouse, there's two yellow cells. These are from a um, scooter that's designed to pull the batteries out, take them home and charge them. And so this, this uh, um, person here is charging these cells and they're gonna experience a similar incident here. So we saw projectiles being tossed around uh, and this is the effect of that fire. There was a dry chemical extinguisher used at some point there. Um, I think this last image right here, you can see that the um, cell was even tossed behind the sofa. Obviously enough energy to cause a very significant loss of property. And uh, um, so again, this for the, the purpose of me showing this is to understand what it looks like when cells vent in consumer products. The gases that are evolved uh, during this process are a combination of flammable and or toxic gases. The majority um, are carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Carbon monoxide is also flammable in addition to being asphyxiant. Um, generally, it's between 30 and 50% each um, in that gas mix. And uh, it, the remaining are other hydrocarbons um, and uh, you know, you can't have some hydrogen cyanides for typically is evolved with or are plastics involved. Hydrogen fluoride um, is a very interesting one. It has been measured, actually hydrofluoric acid has been measured when mixed with water during fire suppression in a couple of different incidents around the world. One in particular was a ferry fire um, that occurred um, in Europe. And uh, the fire service actually measured some hydrogen, hydrofluoric acid in some of the standing water on the ship. Challenges with it is it's a very reactive gas. It's very difficult to capture and collect during the testing process, but uh, it is of concern of some areas. So on the deflagration risk side, um, there have been explosions that have occurred in battery fires. Um, there was a incident in Beijing, that's the lower picture on the right, um, at a power station that unfortunately resulted in the deaths of two firefighters and one technician. Um, and 
that that particular chemistry was an LFP chemistry. So, you know, it is possible for that chemistry to, you know, go into thermal runway and create a hazardous environment. Um, and uh, the incident in Arizona in 2019 um, resulted in, two, in significant injuries to a couple of firefighters. Uh, the picture on the upper right just shows that this was a, a fire that did experience an explosion by the debris there. Um, and one of the challenges in the space today is there is really a limited effective fire suppressant that has been shown during the standardized testing um, in 9540A uh, to truly stop thermal runaway. What we're seeing is a combination of the module design um, as probably being the most effective component to stopping the propagation. Um, but one of the other things that's being seen is a um, more discussion among responders uh, to approach lithium ion incidents as more of a defensive approach to let them burn through their fuel, uh, hopefully prevent an explosion, um, but then also protect for exposures. So that's, a, um, that's something we really need to, to be aware of. Um, because it is a critical part of deploying energy storage is understanding how responders would respond to an incident. In the codes and standards space, um, this graphic here shows the, the variety of different codes and product standards that apply different portions of the system. So at the overall installation level, um, for example, we have the National Electrical Code, NFPA 70, and FPA 855 is the standard for stationary energy storage systems. Um, we have the International Fire Code and then some product standard codes. And IEEE C2 is the utilities version of the National Electric Safety Code. Um, we have some important IEEE standards families that guide us in interconnection and the communication of the battery to the grid. And then at, inside a, a enclosure such as this, we'll have the battery racks and then modules and cells, individual batteries. So this is just a graphical uh, diagram that we find useful uh, for folks that are trying to understand the various regulatory space uh, for producing their products and um, enforcing the codes. So the two primary um, fire codes is the International Fire Code and NFPA 1. Now NFPA 1, points directly to 855. So that's why you just have these two documents on the screen here. There is a, a continual attempt to try and have the language harmonized, but because they're not created exactly on the same schedule, language in one might not be reflected in another one that's at a different phase. So there's always a little bit of inconsistency, but um, I think what we'll find with the 2024 edition of the International Fire Code is it will reflect pretty closely to 855. Uh, these documents cover the design, a hazard mitigation analysis review, uh, commissioning, uh, size and separation and locations of battery placement, uh, requirements for explosion control, emergency response, training and decommissioning of systems. Um, the International Fire Code is the primary fire code adopted in uh, 42 states in the US. So it is, it's really the relevant document. One of the problems though is the adoption. And when you look at this slide here, it really shows you the challenge um, in this space. Each different color is a different version of the International Fire Code that is adopted. And they're not always adopted at the state level. There are a number of states that will have uh, either local or municipal adoptions. And so it's really a patchwork quilt. And for example, the 2021, which is the most recently published one, at the state level, Wyoming is the only one that's adopted. California has brought forth the language for energy storage systems, um, but they're still on the 2018 fire code essentially. So what's most important is to guide um, integrators, utilities, installers into designing and installing to the best known practices, not the minimum standards that's required in the state. So at this time, please take out your phones, turn your camera on and take a picture of this QR code. What it'll bring up is this link at the very bottom. This link is to sign you up for the free quarterly 
safety collaborative reports. Um, so if you are interested in understanding what's happening in these uh, codes and standards um, and opportunities for you to provide input or comments, then this is probably the best way to, to be kept abreast of those. It's produced quarterly um, through the Energy Storage Safety Collaborative. That is an effort between um, PNNL, Sandia, um, and to a lesser part, Oak Ridge. But uh, it's, an, it's a uh, report that it's about 20 pages. You could just scan it. If there's a code that you're interested in, um, this is an easy way to do it. And we only send you uh, these reports. So let's take a look at an incident. Incidents are critical for informing codes and standards. Codes and standards are often reactionary. They'll, they'll uh, try to fix a gap that's been identified or at, to a lesser effective degree, look forward to see where technology might be going. That's a little more difficult. But this incident, I'm sure everyone's heard of this one. This occurred in Liverpool uh, back in September of 2020. Um, this was a site that was used for frequency regulation and managed by an offshore owner and operator. Uh, the first announcement of a problem was an explosion locally. Um, there was no notification to the fire department prior to the explosion. And uh, so it fortunately only affected one enclosure. And uh, this is not deflagration venting. These were the HVAC units that were thrown off as a result of the explosion. Uh, the firefighting operations focused primarily on exposure protection. And uh, there was an explosion with debris thrown between six and 20 meters away. Uh, my comments have nothing to do with the fire cause that has not been released yet. So the firefighting actions really were tried to protect exposures. You can see by these images, they were very limited on their access to direct water into the enclosure is really just through the entry door. Key point, 59 hours of flowing water. I can tell you that where I live in California, if the fire department I work for were flowing water for 59 hours, there would be uh, a number of inquiries into our practices. And that's true for a number of areas around the world with decreasing water supplies. Um, there was a mention of a clean agent system that per CCTV uh, did not uh, discharge. I can't validate that. That's just a comment from the response report from the fire department. There was no uh, explosion prevention or explosion protection. There are two different systems. Uh, neither was required to be installed and was not present. Explosion control is uh, something that is in NFPA 855 um, and in the 2021 International Fire Code. And it calls out um, a couple of options. Deflagration venting, which are commonly understood as pressure relief panels or blowout panels. You can see in the picture in the upper right on that hopper designed to protect after explosions occurred or during an explosion, direct pressure waves, fireballs away from personnel. Deflagration prevention is designed to prevent the explosion. Typically it is an exhaust system and it's, it's uh, designed to keep the LEL below 25% of the lower explosive limit. Um, and then a third option that was added uh, to 855 is a system that's more performance-based than prescriptive to a specific standard. And uh, so that would be an engineered system that would essentially just ensure that you don't have any of those gases that, that build up. And so um, uh, we've developed one technology called IntelliVent that's designed to open doors um, on that. A lot of the data that goes into designing explosion control uh, really is based on the 9540A test method. And this is a test method, it's not a certification, that develops data. It begins at the cell level. We wanna try and determine, can the cell go into thermal runway or produce flammable gases? And if it, if it can, then you'll go through the module level test, the unit level test, and potentially installation level test if a fire suppression system is required. The reports that are coming from the labs are still in their kind of infancy and, and there's some learning um, challenges with them. Some of the reports are not as clear um, some are honestly inaccurate. And that's a challenging space when the codes require those reports to be provided to EHJ. So um, room for improvement in, in these reports and this data. 
Now this slide might seem a little confusing. I wanna um, give a shout out to my colleague, Waylon Clark at Sandia. He and I have, um, Sandia has requested our support to providing some safety support for some of the, the uh, development projects that they do, some of the demonstration projects. So it's a good example of interlab cooperation. And uh, one of the things that we were finding was that there was a gap between what manufacturers thought they had to provide to be listed to 9540 and then what the fire code or NFPA 855 called out um, in the area of explosion control. And so an, a good example of that is that if you wanted to get your product 9540 listed, nowhere in there does it call out explosion control. But if you're installing say on a military base and they're guided by NFPA 855, uh, 855 calls out explosion control. So manufacturers were discovering this a little bit late into their product development stage. Um, it really should be in 9540 and there are some proposals to do that in the next edition 9540. But this slide just kind of calls out that in the International Fire Code, which is adopted by, by states, chapter 12 has the requirements for energy storage. NFPA 855, which a few states, but most federal facilities uh, follow, has a requirement for explosion control. Um, all of these have a requirement for the energy storage to be listed to 9540. And within 9540, um, the fire testing here is required based on the size and, and the spacing of them. So the explosion control here added cabinets um, to the language in a TIA. And that was the part that's not visible to a lot of people. So we wanted to create this slide just to help people understand this. So remaining gaps in the safety is um, in fire suppression agents or methods of applying fire suppression. Water is great. It uh, can have a tremendous BTU absorption capability, but it's also conductive. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, so we've seen some damage to systems that are using water. It might put out the fire that's in that one area, but you can create arcing and sparking in other areas. So it is challenging. Um, deflagration prevention methods. There's definitely opportunities to explore how to prevent explosions. And that is really the direction. Um, and um, further research in thermal runaway propagation prevention. Sandia is doing some great work. I saw Yulia's on the call, really uh, you know, acknowledge the work that her team there at Sandia is doing on trying to identify methods for preventing thermal runaway. I put down emergency energy discharging because um, there are small failures that might render um, the rest of the system capable of discharging it and reducing the fuels and the stranded energy that could be present. Um, that I think is worthy of manufacturers to try and understand a path to, uh, to look at that. And a good example might be a wildfire that could be approaching a stationary energy storage system. Um, rapidly dumping it to the grid is probably the easiest way, um, but I think that there are opportunities for using discharge at the signal of some failure to reduce the fuels. Um, as Vince had mentioned earlier, we're uh, preparing ourselves with our facilities and our support to support manufacturers to develop, test, and validate next generation of safe ESS. So in summary, safety, it's been in the spotlight with several significant uh, failures. The Liverpool ones I shared with you, the Beijing one, um, MOS landing failures resulting in a significant amount of storage off of the grid in California. We've seen a number of recalls in both stationary um, and EVs on the residential market. Um, and the thermal runway prevention, detection, and suppression, those remain really critical gaps to understand more and deservedly of additional funding. Bottom line in this slide here is that when you're adding a lot of safety requirements, it does tip the scale on the cost. And uh, it, that has a negative effect on the cost of the system, the, uh, the ability for it to really be affordable. There are a lot of areas in the country where having a resilient energy storage system um, really means people's safety, people with emergency medical devices or weather related. Um, fatalities due to cold really should not be happening where we can address that with storage. 
So the question that is always on the table is how much risk we're really willing to take to decarbonize our grid. And I think trying to uh, expect that an electrical device would never fail might be a bar too high to reach. So, you know, one, one question is perhaps it's the location the battery is placed and that if a failure occurs, um, the extent of damage is limited based on that location. So I hope there might be a couple of questions that, uh, that we can address. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about safety in this format and appreciate all of you joining. Hey, great job, Matt. Uh, yeah, we do have uh, a number of questions here. Uh, my name is Ryan Franks, by the way. I'm a senior mechanical engineer at Pacific Northwest National Lab and collaborate with Matt and a host of the other people that he's mentioned. Uh, Matt, you know, the first topic I think we should turn to is there's often quite a lot of confusion around NFPA 68 and 69. And uh, two questions for you there. So the first is, is it uh, recommended or required to have a PE sign off or stamp those plans when designing an ESS? And after that, after you answer that one more for you. Um, well, that's gonna be a decision that is made by the AHJ. Um, and the AHJ, um, will likely want to see that a system that if the code requires um, a system be listed to a particular standard uh, might might request that but I can't answer that as a um, across the board answer to that um, it, yeah that's it that's it's going to be a case by case basis by the HJ sure so the second question on that topic is, you know, so we're shifting to this cabinet type of design in a lot of instances, and there's not a lot of free air space in there. Uh, LFP cells generate uh, a lot of gas in just a few seconds. Uh, can compliance with NFPA 69 ever be achieved? Are there new methods in play? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. <clears throat> so let me speak a little bit about 69. So 69 is deflagration prevention. And the method that's being used in this case is called uh, um, combustible gas reduction. And that's done typically with a mechanical exhaust system. It's triggered by a sensor. And um, if there is the possibility that you could be above 25% of the lower explosive limit, there is a provision where you could be between 25 and 60% of the lower explosive limit if you have a SIL level two system, that's a safety integrity level. It's a very um, expensive system. The reason I mention that is with a cabinet with very small amount of free air volume, um, it's very possible that with a larger format cell, um, you could very quickly get up above 25%. And so the, the expense of that system and the reliability of maintaining below those limits is very challenging. Um, I can't say it can't be done. I can only refer, reflect what I'm hearing from fire protection engineers and some manufacturers that one, it's a very expensive approach and there's some questions about whether or not it can be done. So that was why we introduced the concept of an automatic door system such as IntelliBent. We felt that a very simple a uh, fail safe system of opening all doors at the detection of smoke and heat um, would be a reliable method of ensuring that you're not having an enclosure anymore. That will only work on a cabinet where there's a lot of exterior doors. Um, but it's because of this, we think that it's, a, it's challenging to meet 69. Great, and a little bit connected to that is there's a lot of discussion, as we know, around firefighter training and firefighter response, and especially how that plays into project development. Is there an established curriculum? Can you point to some resources for uh, firefighter and first responder training for ESS? Sure, yeah, I see that submitted by my friend Ken Willette, who um, was with the NFPA, now with the, another great firefighting organization. Um, NFPA, created a training program that I was fortunate enough to be one of the SMEs on that. Um, that training program is still available, it's free online. However, it is outdated. It was created before the Arizona um, incident. And as a result of those firefighter injuries, 
uh, the cadre of instructors actually recommend removing some of the recommendations about doing gas monitoring because the places are fire, fire too close. Um, I would say there is an opportunity for more training. Um, and uh, that is a space that, um, you know, I'm interested in trying to uh, use the resources that were provided by the uh, Office of Electricity and Dr. Zhuk to, to create some training. Um, and uh, so I think to Ken's question, um, as far as a readily available resource for energy storage training, there's some good training on PV that's available through IREC, um, supported by the International Association of Firefighters. But for energy storage, um, I think that's an area where we still need to create some more training. Got it. And so this is a frequent topic of conversation as well. So talking, shifting a little bit to codes and standards uh, and, and their play, uh, can you talk a little bit about the intersection of 9540 and UL 9540A? Is one of them required or both required? Are there any different instances? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so if you look at the scope of 9540, all right, that is the product listing. Um, in that scope, it states that if a unit is greater than 50 kilowatt hours, that it, it points you to, 90, to 9548, to doing the fire testing. Now, what is a unit? That is an area that needs more definition, but at the writing, at the time of the writing of that standard, the unit meant essentially a single freestanding assembly. So it could be considered a rack. Um, and that is how a lot of the testing is done. If a manufacturer wants to call their entire cabinet a unit, they, they could, um, but again, that's likely gonna be greater than 50 kilowatt hours. Now I'm not talking about residential. Um, so that's one that would trigger the fire testing. The other one is the spacing. If there is any spacing of units closer than three feet, that also triggers the 9540A testing. So the bottom line, the answer to that question is um, that any energy storage system that has individual units greater than 50 kilowatt hours or close to three feet would trigger the 9540A testing. Um, and so some might say, well, isn't it just required for all? And I, I think it's probably safer uh, for manufacturers to assume that they should go through that. Um, there's some valuable data that comes from it that can help in the design. And I'll just add this. Um, if, exa for example, you wanted to utilize um, a automatic door system for explosion control, it's valuable to understand that if there were a fire, what kind of heat flux could you potentially have outside of that open door, exposing maybe the next row of cabinets? That will help you as a manufacturer understand what kind of insulation package you want to have on your doors to protect against that heat flux. Um, so there's a lot of valuable data that comes from the 9540A test. And there's, there's a lot of follow-up questions regarding 9540A actually as well. So uh, the first of those is there are a couple of different uh, revisions and additions. Uh, there is a difference in the third and the fourth edition and we live in this dynamic environment with compliance. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about the differences uh, between the third and fourth revisions in 9540A and, and how people are complying with those? Well, I'll say it real simply. Nine, the third edition does not exist anymore. <laughs> um, the reason why there was an, a, an update is because the method that was being utilized by some of the testing wasn't truly, um, the, the intent of that test was not being realized by the way the testing was done. So an example of that, manufacturer might have a pouch cell. And the heater that was applied to the pouch cell might be a very small heater that wasn't really subjecting the cell to the worst case scenario, as well as the ramp rate, the amount of heat and the timing of that um, was maybe not really putting the cell in a thermal runaway, where if you had used a larger heater that represented potentially the whole size of the cell and a, a more significant ramp rate, truly getting the cell in the thermal runaway is the intention of the test. And so if you weren't getting it into thermal runaway, you're missing the intent. So that's, that's one of the examples of, of the change that occurred. Um, 
And there, there's a number of other areas in there, in the fourth edition. But yeah, the fourth edition is the edition that um, if you're making a product today, you have to test to. Got it. So when we talk about compliance with codes and standards, uh, especially in the, the UL uh, listing realm, there are a couple of different terms that are thrown around. Uh, field listing, factory certification, uh, listing itself. And now uh, there is this new concept, uh, at least in the energy storage space of, of sub-assembly listings. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how those work together and what people need to consider as they move forward with products and projects? Well, Ryan, I feel like giving that one right to you, given your background with the uh, neurals, if it, you know, I'd, let, I'd like you know, to get your thoughts. I'll, I'll just say that, at the, at the at very simplistic level, um, a field evaluation is done often for products that cannot be sent to the lab. It might be a one-off uh, cabinet where a the national, you know, the NERL, nationally recognized testing lab field evaluator goes out and assesses all of the components to ensure that they are um, assembled, uh, comprised. Um, and uh, and function in the intention of the uh, of the listing process, and so it's it's done. Um, if there's destructive testing, it can't be done. But they would take test reports from the manufacturer and apply that to see if it meets the intent of the lab. How how would you describe that that question? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the invitation. So uh, uh, in a normal uh, listing situation where you have things continually coming out of a factory, uh, the the whole certification scheme isn't merely the testing, but it, it's also on follow follow on uh, inspections and initial inspections of the production environment. And so if that can't be done, if you're designing a very unique product or not producing it all the time, uh, another situation like uh, uh, might, might be necessary. Uh, but in addition, the, as with many things other than energy storage, uh, there's now, uh, at least with some testing laboratories, the concept of a um, pre-certification environment, a sub-assembly uh, type of listing, which allows manufacturers of components to perform some of that testing, meet some of the, demonstrate some of the requirements, so that, that can then be rolled up into uh, a larger, more comprehensive system. Good, thanks for that, Ed. Absolutely. Uh, so one more question on 9540A probably is uh, there is uh, some call in the next revision uh, to include ignition of flammable gases during testing. Um, is, is this being considered? What might the ramifications be? Et cetera. Yeah, no, thanks Andrew for asking that. I think that that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. And for those of you who might not be as familiar, let's say that um, a cell manufacturer does a cell and a module test and the cells vent, but there's no flame. Um, so that might be very helpful to show the, that if a battery fails, it's not going to light you know, the next module on fire or extend to the structure. That, that's good. But the production of flammable gas is still there. And so the explosion risk has to be addressed. So there, there is some question about uh, introducing an igniter to understand what the heat flux is, going to my earlier comment. Um, I can't speak, Andrew, to whether or not it will be in there, but I can say that there is um, a lot of interest in, um, in seeing that data. And uh, so I don't know whether or not it's, it's introduced at a certain stage, at the beginning, um, a, a secondary test. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I think that the, the information is important because just because flame didn't occur during that test doesn't mean that's how it would always fail. And that's a really important thing for everyone to understand is that the 9548 tests are done with batteries that are not interconnected to the grid. They are not electrically running. So any cooling systems are off. Uh, BMS is off. And does that result in a different failure from one that could be a, occurring in an operating system. And it, it's possible. In a sense, this current test is almost a commodity test. And so I think it's important to understand where we really need to evaluate because you have a lot of sources of ignition in the operating system. 
And so that factory test of a gas plume could actually be a flame, a jet flame in, in real life. So um, I think your question's valid. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it one step further. Um, there is some belief that a thermal runaway event in a energized module with potentially very high voltages on the bus bars, very close to that module, could result in some conductivity through that conductive uh, um, gas. And so there could be additional um, arcing that occurs at the module level that results in more ignitions of cells. So the design of a module in the 9540A test, does that really relate to the same type of fire in a fully energized system? So I think it's an interesting question. So the next question is, <clears throat> there are a lot of new technologies, techniques around gas detection, uh, including sound, pressure, UV, infrared. Um, how do those get incorporated into uh, ongoing changing codes and standards like an NFPA 855 or a UL uh, uh, safety standard? Well, New, new technologies used for gas detection have to, have to meet some standard, all right? So there are, there are UL standards for gas detection. I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, I will state that the whole sphere of gas detection in energy storage is a challenging space. It's not simply utilizing nitrogen, or I mean, I'm sorry, hydrogen, because there are many other gases present. And for example, a hydrogen gas sensor has cross sensitivities to carbon monoxide. What's another gas that's liberally you know, released during uh, thermal runaway? Carbon monoxide. Um, in addition, a lot of the products of combustion, the soot, uh, re results in fouling. So there is, there is some accuracy issues in when it comes to gas detection. And uh, there are many that feel that just the initial sensing of a problem is good, but the accuracy and the, the objective ongoing measurements are problematic through an event. Um, so I, I think, you know, I see we're almost at time here. Yeah, um, maybe one last question if you if you uh, if you're if you're able and willing. Uh, over. Great. So, you know, these energy storage systems are, are comprised of components. Um, there's a lot to think about uh, when designing new products, when designing new projects. When should people begin to think about safety? Yesterday. Yeah. Got it. So, so no, great question. And not, not to just toss that one off. Um, anyone looking to develop a product needs to get involved in the regulatory space to understand what kind of testing they'll have to do, because you do not want to discover um, that you have to go back and design an explosion control system after you've been awarded an RFP and you're trying to meet a delivery date of that energy storage system. And now someone's telling you need explosion control when you didn't see that coming. So um, for manufacturers, that could be um, that could be a project ending or company ending um, decision due to the cost of this testing. So um, in day one of your development, you need to understand the regulatory requirements. Perfect. Now back on to Vince to close us out, I believe. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, Ryan, for hosting that. And thanks to everyone that participated in the uh, providing questions for us. Hopefully we got to most of them. Uh, as we went through. I think some of the questions have been answered about presentations had been uh, and provided a link in the chat. Just two things as we close out. Um, one, uh, in the chat, there is a link to the safety and reliability forum uh, that is uh, being put on for uh, DOE's Office of Electricity Energy Storage Program. That is what, May 4th and 5th, I believe. Um, secondly is this was our inaugural uh, kickoff of this webinar series. Our plan is to do this about every two weeks with a different storage topic. And so I would encourage you to look at April 14th, we will have Dee Wu who leads our analytics team that you know once we've safely designed and installed the storage system, how do you maximize the value? Uh, depending on where you are in the country and what kind of models and tools are available for you to get the most out of this energy storage system. So that will be April 14th. Uh, at the same time, uh, again, link to that is in the chat uh, window where you can register for that. 
and we hope to see a lot of you back here by then. So thank you again uh, for attending and looking forward to uh, continuing our conversations. Thank you.